In veterinary medicine, diagnostic labs play a critical role in the diagnosis and management of diseases in our patients. In this lecture, we'll talk about why to use a diagnostic lab and some foundational concepts that will help you to understand how a diagnostic functions and what they do. So first off, why use a diagnostic lab? Why is it important that owners spend their money for you to run diagnostic tests? Well, there's a few key reasons. First, we need to determine if an infectious agent is present. Does your patient or does the herd or flock actually have an infection? You need to obtain an etiological diagnosis. So what organism are you actually dealing with? And then ultimately, we need to guide antimicrobial therapy. So what is the most appropriate drug to use? What are the organisms susceptible to? And what are you most likely to be successful with when applied clinically? As professionals, as veterinarians, the onus is on you to understand the value of diagnostic laboratory reports and therefore be able to explain to your client why a laboratory-based uh, diagnostic test is critical to the management of their, their animals. Beyond diagnosing specific infections, diagnostic labs play other important functions. They're really valuable sources of data for passive disease surveillance, and this could be looking at antimicrobial resistance, looking at trends or outbreaks. They play regulatory roles, so testing for reporting reportable diseases, um, as well as import and export requirements. They also have a really critical public health and food safety role. From my perspective, they also play an important role in research. Diagnostic submissions are a really valuable source of research materials that are otherwise very difficult and expensive to get. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about some really foundational concepts. So we're going to start off with the colony forming unit. We'll talk about how bacteria grow, different types of media, how we identify organisms, and we're going to end by discussing biological risk groups and biocontainment levels. So first, what is a colony? On this plate, you can see a, a mucoid Klebsiella pneumoniae, and all of these blue circles are highlighting individual colonies. But what differentiates a colony from a colony-forming unit, which I'm sure is a term that you've heard in the past? Well, if we look at an individual colony, and then we zoom in, and we zoom in some more, and we zoom in some more, what you'll eventually see is that that colony is composed of probably billions of individual bacteria. So as healthcare professionals, what you need to understand is that colonies on an agar plate are populations of bacteria. Remember, bacteria are very, very tiny. So each of those colonies is a clonal population, which descended from a single viable organism. That ancestor organism is what we call the colony forming unit. Bacteria divide really quickly. So remember that individuals can quickly become millions or billions of organisms. So if we assume a 20 minute generation time, which is sort of our archetypal E. coli, if we start with a single CFU, one colony forming units, how many organisms do you think you would have after one day of unimpeded division? Maybe pause the video and just think about sort of the order of magnitude that we'd be dealing with. If we start with that one colony forming unit and allow it to double and double and double every 20 minutes, after 24 hours, we would have an absolutely astronomical number of organisms, 4.72 times 10 to the 21. Now, this is obviously just a thought experiment. Lots of things would become limiting far before we would reach this number. Waste products would build up and become toxic. Nutrients would become depleted. And space would probably become limiting as well. But all of this to say that bacteria are tiny, they divide rapidly, and small numbers quickly become big numbers. Because a colony theoretically represents the presence of a single viable progenitor organism, 
and is therefore a clonal population. So all genetically homogenous, they've originated by binary fission. We can use the presence of colonies on a plate to estimate the number of bacteria, the concentration of bacteria or colony forming units in an original sample. So what that might look like is that we have our, our sample over here on the left. Maybe this is a tube of urine or broth. And we can make one in 10 dilutions of that suspension and then make spread plates of those dilutions. Um, so spreading out 100 microliters onto each plate and then counting colonies. And what you can see in this cartoon is that as our dilution factor goes up, so we have a more and more dilute sample, we start to be able to resolve individual colonies. And here at 10 to the minus 6, so a 1 in a million dilution, if we count, you can see that we have 14 colonies in 0.1 mils divided by our dilution factor gives us an initial concentration of 140 million CFUs per mil. So the obvious question and what future veterinarians are always interested in is why do we care? Why is it important to know how many organisms were present in that initial sample or are present in our uh, laboratory working stocks? Well, there's a few reasons. First is to establish clinical significance. For instance, a free catch urine, um, we expect to find some bacteria in that. The distal urethra is not sterile. And so a urinary tract infection is defined as greater than 50,000 colony forming units per mil. Looking at bacterial quantities is also very helpful in identifying contaminants. So looking at the dominant organism in mixed cultures can be really helpful. And also to standardize laboratory tests. Some of the assays that the lab is going to be performing require you to test a specific number of organisms. Using too few or too many will result in a, a, a laboratory result that we can't actually interpret. So it is very important. It is entirely clinically relevant. When we're working with plates in the lab, we always want to make sure that we streak out our plates for isolation. We want these individual colonies at the end here because each of these are pure. This is a pure culture, a pure isolate that we can then work with. The way that we accomplish this is to use the four streak method. So in our first streak, we played out our initial sample. This could be the swab of a wound. It could be a, a loop that's dipped into some urine. And then from that first streak, we make three additional streaks using a, a sterile loop. So our sterile loop is going to go into the first streak, spread those bacteria out, and then dilute them. We'll re-sterilize our loop, make our third streak, re-sterilize our loop, and make our fourth streak. The objective here is to dilute the sample out such that we get pure isolated colonies. This is a very useful technique in that it's semi-quantitative. So we can describe how many colonies are growing on these plates in a way that anybody can understand. You may have heard plates being described as being 1 plus E. coli or 2 plus Staphylococcus aureus. In this case, 1 plus refers to having greater than 10 colonies on our first streak, but fewer than 10 colonies on any subsequent streak. 2 plus would be greater than 10 colonies on our second streak and fewer than that subsequently, 3 plus greater than 10 on our third, and fewer on the fourth, and 4 plus would be very heavy growth, greater than 10 colonies on our fourth streak. If we were to have fewer than 10 colonies on our first streak, we would describe this as scant. This is a semi-quantitative method that allows us to ordinarily compare the quantity of growth. Once we have our isolated colonies, our goal is to get an isolate. So we would pick one of those isolated colonies from our most distal streak and subculture that probably to blood agar so that we can have a pure clonal culture that's derived from a single colony. The advantage of this is that all of the organisms growing on this plate are genetically homogenous. It's all one isolate. And this is what's suitable and really what's required for additional characterization. So this is what we would move on to identify 
and to do susceptibility testing on in order that we can provide the clinician with some data to, to treat their patient. There's a wide variety of culture media that can be selected and selection of primary media, so what that sample is first streaked out onto, really depends on what organisms you're interested in isolating. What is your target pathogen? I would say in general, blood agar plus McConkie is a pretty standard uh, set of, of agar for routine culture. The introduction of selective and differential media facilitates uh, presumptive identification on primary culture. So based on the colony morphology or simple presence or absence of growth, it can give you some idea of what's there. And we'll talk about some of those media in the next slides. Selective media is used to preferentially isolate particular taxa. So it contains chemicals or antibiotics that are able to inhibit the growth of non-target organisms. So some examples, CNA agar or colistin nalodixic acid agar selects for gram-positive bacteria and against gram-negative bacteria. McConkie agar uh, contains bile salts and crystal violet, which allows it to select for gram-negative enterics, and it's a commonly used media for isolating organisms like E. coli, and it selects against gram positives. So we expect to only find gram negatives growing. There's a wide variety of examples of selective media. One that I've uh, included here just as, as an illustrative point is Campybab. It contains a variety of antimicrobials to select for Campylobacter jejuni and to select against most other bacteria. So selective media can be designed to be as selective as uh, the application requires. Differential media exploits some physiological property of the organism to produce a particular colony morphology, oftentimes something colorimetric that allows us to look at a colony and say, mm, we think that is organism X. So McConkie agar, in addition to being selective, is also differential. It contains lactose and a pH indicator, which allows us to differentiate lactose fermenters from lactose non-fermenters. XLD agar includes ferric ammonium citrate, which allows us to identify hydrogen sulfide producers. They turn black on this media. And then there's a wide variety of chromogenic media. Chromagar is one particular brand that contain proprietary differential ingredients. These allow the differentiation of a variety of bacteria, depending on which specific product is being used. Here you can see some examples of selective and differential media. On the far left here, we have Chromagar ESBL. It's selective for third generation cephalosporin resistance, and it differentiates based on species. So in this case, we have pink colonies, which are indicative of E. coli, and blue colonies or turquoise colonies, which are non-E. coli Enterobacteriaceae. So selects for resistance, differentiates based on species. Another Chromagar ESBL plate, blue colonies, non-E. coli Enterobacteriaceae, and white colonies are Pseudomonas species. And then on the right, we have Chromagar MRSA. It selects for methicillin resistance, so an antibiotic resistance phenotype and it differentiates Staphylococcus aureus from other Staphylococci, yielding these pink colonies. Here are some non-proprietary examples. So Manitol salt agar, it selects for halophilic organisms, so those bacteria that are able to grow at high salt concentrations, high sodium chloride concentrations, and it differentiates those which grow based on their ability to ferment mannitol. So mannitol fermenters, form these nice bright yellow colonies. One example would be Staphylococcus aureus. Eosin methylene blue selects four gram negatives, and just like McConkie, differentiates based on lact lactose fermentation. So we see these metallic green colonies, which are classical for E. coli. <music>